We're going to begin our discussion with a look at immune cells in the brain that are called microglial cells. Now these cells exist in a multitude of forms, but for the purposes of our discussion, we're just going to look at two forms, the M2 and M1 form. Generally, we associate the M2 uh, form of the microglia as being helpful. It takes care of us, it nurtures our brain cells, it nurtures the synapses, it helps to gobble up dangerous misfolded proteins, it gets rid of beta amyloid. So we really want our uh, microglia to exist in the M2 form. They can, however, shift to the M1 form, and when they do so, it increases inflammation in the brain, they digest away uh, neurons, they digest away the synapses, they are less able to get rid of things like uh, beta amyloid. So the real question is, why do our microglia shift? Well, there are a lot of inputs, as a matter of fact, that can cause the normally healthy, a good twin to become the dangerous bad twin. Things like toxins certainly have been well explored uh, in Parkinson's inflammation, insulin resistance, uh, viruses, elevated blood sugar, and head trauma all are associated, and more, uh, with Parkinson's and also this shift from the angel to the assassin. There's actually a book uh, by that title that deals with this topic, but shifting <clears throat> an important immune cell in the brain to being threatening. So the question would be, what can we do then uh, to reduce this from happening? And certainly one thing we can do is to reduce our exposure to toxins, reduce our inflammation by changing our diets, as well insulin resistance, uh, being careful that we're not exposed to viruses, keeping our blood sugar under control, and obviously not uh, getting bumped in the head uh, as frequently as may occur, for example, in contact uh, sports uh, enthusiasts. So that helps us reduce the conversion of these uh, microglial cells to being aggressive. And this is a fundamental mechanism involved in Parkinson's. We see that these microglia become what's called activated and are threatening to specific cells in the brain, in a specific area of the brain, uh, that leads to the clinical manifestations of this disease. So the question then becomes, can we intervene here? Can we help keep those cells uh, in check uh, from not converting to being threatening? And this is what a good microglial uh, cell looks like, and it, it can change to being in a situation where it becomes more threatening, that it increases uh, inflammation uh, and changes its immune signature, and it changes uh, all of the ability that it has to be good to neurons based upon changes in its metabolism. The point I'm trying to make here is that metabolism, how our entire body's cells use glucose fuel or other sources of fuel to make energy controls this immune function. This is central to the notion of what is called immunometabolism. And as it relates to a Parkinson's disease, we've known for quite some time that there is indeed a relationship between diabetes, a metabolic problem, and risk for getting Parkinson's in the first place. This study published back in 2011 looked at close to 300,000 patients followed for five years, uh, 1,500 developed Parkinson's, and the risk of those uh, patients uh, getting uh, who were diabetic of getting Parkinson's was 40% or 41% increase. In other words, if you're diabetic, you've increased your risk of Parkinson's. And more recently, when we looked at what is the impact of type 2 diabetes in Parkinson's disease, a study from 2022, it showed that uh, look in, in data that was obtained from 72 centers, that risk of things like the severity of motor symptoms uh, is significantly increased, the severity of the motor symptoms in, uh, if a Parkinson's patient also has type 2 diabetes. That's the red uh, bar curve. If we look at the severity of the non-motor symptoms, again increased, and the likelihood of loss of independence if a, a Parkinson's patient also has type 2 diabetes is uh, more than doubled. Uh, what is the likelihood of depression? Also a metabolic condition significantly increased in the Parkinson's patient if they are type 2 diabetic. In other words, if they have a higher degree 
of metabolic compromise. So what is all the excitement about these days in terms of reining in uh, things like metabolic problems, diabetes and obesity? What are people talking about? They're talking about drugs that are called GLP-1 agonists. Uh, these are drugs, for example, like Ozempic. Uh, and so what do these drugs do and what might the implications be as it relates to neurodegenerative conditions like Parkinson's, for example, which is a brain metabolic uh, issue. What do these drugs do? They target the central issues that are going wrong in the Parkinson's brain. Inflammation, loss of neurotrophic uh, functionality, loss of protection, and loss of insulin functionality, as a matter of fact. All of these problems are improved with GLP-1 stimulating drugs this is a study back in 2022, as mentioned, that explored the idea of using these drugs in neurodegenerative conditions in general, but what about specifically in Parkinson's? And as it turns out, a study was just published in the New England Journal of Medicine, well-respected, uh, uh, peer-reviewed medical journal. I think we would all agree, perhaps one of the most well-respected uh, medical journals on the planet looked at 156 Parkinson's patients. They either got a GLP-1 Ozempic-like drug or a placebo a drug for 12 months, and they were evaluated on the UPDRS. What in the world is that? The Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. It's a tool that neurologists use to rate their Parkinson's patients in terms of how they are doing. The higher the score, the worse a patient is doing. So let's look at this PDRS and, and look at comparing the placebo group in terms of the overall score uh, versus those uh, who were given the GLP-1 agonist drug. And that's the orange bar that you see on the right side. In other words, that's actually slightly below the zero line, meaning actually slight improvement in the three-year study in the group of Parkinson's patients who received a GLP-1 drug. What about uh, other issues like side effects? Uh, for example, nausea, vomiting, and GI reflux, which we know can happen uh, on these GLP-1 agonist drugs. And when we look at this, we see that in fact, people treated with this lixacentide, which is not available now, uh, had a significant increased risk of developing these uh, side effects. Uh, pretty, pretty obvious that uh, these people were on the drug. So the point is uh, that metabolism is central to Parkinson's. This interventional trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, demonstrated a significant effect. In fact, these people over the course of three years had uh, no change in their uh, level of functionality in terms of the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. Music